Amen. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Union Congregational Church, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I am not Reverend Katrina. I am Jeremy Whitener, the co-director of music here. Reverend Katrina is away today in Phoenix, Arizona, participating in the Next Generation Leadership Initiative, a program of the UCC that equips, energizes, and empowers younger UCC local church pastors to build vibrant congregations that change lives and further God's mission in the world. We want to especially welcome any of those of you who are joining us online today and anyone here for the first time this morning. If you are a visitor, we invite you to fill out a welcome card and you're found in the pew and leave it in the offering plate later in the service so that we can follow up and further connect if you desire. Also, we have a special treat this morning. Since there are not uh, too many hymns about stained glass windows, we invite you f- to suggest some hymns. John David was in the back. He'll also be around during the passing of the peace time for you to uh, write down a name of a hymn. Thank you. <laughs> and he'll draw a few out for us to do um, after Tim Chris shares with us today. And you don't need to know the number, just the title. You can write that down. Now. As the busyness of the holiday season, I'm sure you know, is already quickly fast approaching. Our calendars are filling up, our lives quickly move by. So many things to do, 
deadlines to beat, errands to run, meetings to attend, more meetings, and then meetings to meet about the meetings that you need to meet about. We move and we go and we do and we go and we do. But let us today shift our focus from doing into just being. Let us pause and breathe. Let us be now with open hearts and minds ready to receive God's presence into our lives. So let us worship God together. I invite you to rise, embody your spirit, and join me in our call to worship. God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? God is our shelter and refuge on the days of trouble and our hope and joy on the days of celebration. Day after day, we seek God's face in the assurance of God's holy love. O oh God, do not turn from us or hide your face from us. Be our guide and our light instead. One thing we ask of God, that we may live in God's dwelling place all the days of our life and never cease to behold the beauty of God's home. Beloved of God, enter this worship in thanksgiving. For God is among and within us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join us in our opening hymn, This is the Day, found in your New Century Hymnal, number 84. We call upon your power to make all things new. We confess that we have compromised your good news and settled for a comfortable gospel rather than embrace the radical love, hospitality, and inclusion of your kingdom. We have been satisfied with a faith that conforms to the world rather than the one that challenges the systems and the ways of the world. Forgive us for our focus on our own survival, pleasure, while your creation perishes all around us. For your mercy and your repentance, we pray. Amen. Beloved, you bear the image of God. You receive power from the Spirit of God. Be encouraged that holy love meets you with boldness and renewal. Let God be glorified as you accept the call to be the activating agents of a new world where love reigns, hope endures, and peace abounds. As transformed and transforming people, let us greet one another with a word of hope and peace. A greeting in the chat, if you are online, 
or a hug or a handshake to your neighbor. Hope endures. Peace. Excuse me. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Today's reading is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The word of the Lord. If there are any children here this morning, I invite you to come to the steps. Uh, This morning, a little something different. As I was reflecting on the beautiful windows that we're going to hear about today, I thought about the beautiful colors that we see. And so today, for our children's time, um, kids, as you come up, if you want to grab some bells, uh, we're going to play a little bit today. So also, if there's any young at heart folk that would like to come, the, the colorful ones, the colorful ones.
Thank you, choir. That, that was lovely. There's a saying posted on the wall outside the Japanese tea ceremony room in Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. It's by Sen no Rikyu, a 16th century Buddhist monk. We draw water, gather firewood, boil the water, and make tea. Beyond this, you must come to your own understanding. You must come to your own understanding. In that moment, in that museum gallery in Boston in early September, I thought about our weekly Sunday services here in this church. We do not engage, of course, in a Japanese tea ceremony ritual. But there are ritual aspects to our worship. Instead of drawing water and gathering firewood, Reverend Foreman prepares our weekly liturgy, delivers her sermon, and leads us in prayer. John David and Jeremy select the music, and the choir sings. Ushers greet and guide us. But beyond this, our worship service is an invitation inviting each of us to reach for spiritual insight. It is up to us to come to our own understanding. But there is more. Just as the layout of the tea ceremony room is part of the tea ceremony, so our sanctuary is part of our worship experience. People who came before us created this space for worship, They've made changes over the years, sometimes major changes, to our chancel, to the layout of our pews, to the location of our communion table, to the lighting. And we are once again thinking about changing and updating these things to augment the worship experience for our own day. But the people who came before us also added element, other elements that we are not planning to change. At the end of the First World War, they commissioned Tiffany's studio to design stained glass for the three lancets in the chancel wall. Then toward the end of World War II, they commissioned Conic studio in Boston to design stained glass for the six windows in the side aisles of our sanctuary, what at the time they called our auditorium. These two sets of windows, Tiffany's pictorial opalescent stained glass and Connick's highly symbolic medieval revival stained glass complement each other and are key aspects of the worship experience prepared for us in this space. If you are like me, the Tiffany windows are far more accessible. For one thing, they are right in front of us, uh, drawing our gaze. For another, they are easier to read because they are pictorial. We talk much less about the conic windows. Their design, as I said, is highly symbolic, and they are literally off to the side, so we have to divert our gaze to look at them. Many of us are not sure what they're meant to represent. This morning, while Reverend Foreman is away at her Next Generation Leadership Conference in Phoenix, I want to talk about the conic windows and encourage you to engage with them when you spend time in this place. Not only this morning, but on future mornings, and perhaps come to your own understanding. It's a good time to do this. Eighty years ago this week, on Sunday, November 12, 1944, more than 600 members and friends of this church gathered here for a special dedication service to view for the first time the six stained glass windows along the north and the south sides all designed by Charles J. Connick, considered the best and most creative stained glass maker of the 20th century. At the service, the six windows were dedicated one by one, 
by the Reverend George Vincent, after whom our Vincent building is named, starting with a Conover window in the southeast corner on the south side, continuing with the Bliss stocking window and the DeForest windows on the south side. Vincent then turned to the Howe window and to the Philip window on the north side. Finally, he reached the vertical window in the middle of the north side, called the War Service Window. Connick had designed this special window to harmonize with the other windows, but he had keyed it, quote, in a richer color scheme with an emphasis on a full palette. He also used higher quality glass that cost twice as much per foot as the glass in the other windows. Charles Connick thought that light and color were especially appropriate design elements for churches. There is, of course, a lot about light in the Bible. The first creation story in Genesis tells us that the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In Psalm 27, as Kayla read, the psalmist declares, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? While the 119th Psalm reminds us, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Conic firm re referenced one more verse from the Bible in the description they prepared for us about our windows, noting, quote, the artist in glass could not do better to have for his guiding star these words from the letter of John. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Connick designed the Conover window first, and it set the pattern for the other horizontal windows. He created forms and scenes with both separate pieces of glass, and by scratching away black paint to reveal the colored glass underneath. The growing forms throughout each window are meant to suggest the parable of the vine and its related symbol, the tree of life. The thin pieces of glass uh, around each of the five panels in each of the five windows are intended to suggest cloud forms, while the stars recall what Connick termed the heavenly reaches and the reward of steadfast faith. Since the Conover window was given in memory of Louise Conover by her sons, Connick conceived of it as a woman's window, with the larger central medallion showing Dorcas, who the Book of Acts tells us was, quote, full of good works. She holds a small garment with which to clothe the poor. The eight smaller medallions that frame Dorcas suggest woman's work in the church and community, what Connick intended as modern applications of the Beatitudes. The medallion in the upper left, now shaded, um, shows the symbol of a woman writing, then tending candles and preparing flowers, while in the upper right, the woman is studying with her library of books behind her. The middle level of medallions show a woman sewing, visiting the sick, helping the poor, and on the far right, knitting. Opposite the Conover window is the Howe window, given in memory of Dr. Clarence Howe by his widow. The dominant theme of this window is music. The large figure in the middle is the psalmist David with his harp and is meant to show the joy and ecstasy of religious music. The medallions along the top illustrate the virtues of gentleness, loyalty, friendship, and leadership, 
with, story, with scenes from the story of David. When I first started my research on the conic windows, I went online to see if anyone had posted photos of our windows. And about the only photo I found was tagged as loving couple dancing. <laughs> that confused me until I realized it was the medallion with David and Jonathan in the Howe window representing the virtue of friendship. I'm not sure David and Jonathan are dancing, but they were certainly two men who loved each other. The middle row of medallions uh, illustrate the same four virtues, with a symbolic figure playing the organ, worshiping, visiting the sick, and leading a choir. The other three horizontal windows explore additional themes related to St. Paul and St. Timothy in the Bliss stocking window to Cornelius, the Roman soldier who uh, converted to Christianity and is mentioned in the Book of Acts, to the uh, Philip's window in the back corner there with the theme of the Good Samaritan. You can read about, uh, read descriptions of these windows in the coming weeks as we uh, include descriptions in the uh, weekly emails. Then there's the vertical window on the north side, the so-called war service window. We marked Veterans Day earlier this week, just as people in this church did 80 years ago on the day before the conic windows were dedicated and at a time when our nation was still at war. Perhaps you took the time on Monday to think of the people you know who served in different ways. Personally, I thought of Scott Randall and Ted O'Dell, who served during the Vietnam War, as did my older brother. I thought of my father, who served as a chaplain in the US Navy during World War II, and of my father-in-law, who took part in the D-Day invasion and survived. And I'm sure, like many of you, my thoughts also turned to our current wars, to Ukraine and the Middle East, and especially to how wars destroy the lives of innocent civilians, so evident now in Gaza and increasingly in Lebanon. Over 300 men and women associated with this church served during World War II and their families contributed the, the money for this window as a tribute to them in amounts ranging from $1 to $250. The average donation was less than $15. Larry Frick's mother, recently married and thinking of her new husband serving in the Navy in the Pacific, was one of those who gave. Their collective fundraising effort is a good example of abundant life, as our current generosity or stewardship campaign puts it, of how working together our congregation can do big things. When Reverend Vincent turned to dedicate the war service window, he emphasized that it was not merely a war window, but instead a peace window placed, as he put it, with, quote, our unfaltering dedication to the cause of peace. He added that while we see, quote, in the lower section, the figure of Joshua and medallions suggestive of the patriot warrior, the crowning feature is the figure of Isaiah, the prophet of peace, the seer who foretold a day when men would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and the nations would not learn war anymore. Isaiah is shown, as Reverend Vincent put it, with, quote, brilliance and beauty, rising above the more brutal drawing of the figure of Joshua, the warrior. John Osborne tells me he has looked at that window for more than 40 years. 
taking in its detail and color. He's noticed the service emblems embedded on the sides and encircled by fleur-de-lis. But at the apex, the highest point above Isaiah, is not a military emblem, but instead the symbol of the Red Cross. John has come to his understanding. May we each do the same as we live with these windows. And when we catch the dance of changing light, may we recall that passage from 1 John. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. May it be so. Amen. All good. Okay, thanks. So, I know I'm loud. I'm trying not to be that loud. Um, okay, so now has come the time. Like I told you, uh, like we said earlier, um, for those of you who don't know, I was not raised in a hymnal church. We did not have hymnals in our pews. We didn't even have pews. So, um, often when I pick the hymns for the morning, it's based off the scripture reference or the theme, meaning we don't always get to sing the old favorites. And so we want to try to incorporate some time occasionally for you to get to dictate what you, what is on your heart to sing to the Lord. So this morning, you need both a red and new century hymnal. You need both. They are spaced out up there, so if you need to find one. And you are welcome to rise or sit as you need, but lift your voices up to the Lord. These are your choices, so I hope you're excited. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. so that we're not here all day. So if you will switch to the New Century Hymnal to hymn number 433. Hymn 433, in the bulb there is a flower. Also, in case you were curious, the way these were selected is you put them in the basket, and I drew six at random in the middle of Tim's lovely sermon. So if you didn't get yours picked, that was the Lord's choice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Oh. Gotta turn one page to him four thirty six. God of grace and God of glory.
you after your announcements. We enter now into a time of prayer, lifting up the joys and concerns of the community. This week, we pray for Ronan Fuse, Joan Eichland, Amy Hahn's brother Bob, Mary Kay, a friend of Armin, Doris Brett, Gloria Spinella, Katrina and John Rogers, and their colleagues at the Next Generation of Leadership Conference this week, and for those you name in your hearts. People of God, let us pray. Life-giving, salvation-making God, we have staked our living and our dying and our being raised to new life on your steadfast love and faithfulness. You have promised to hide us in your shelter in the day of trouble. You have promised to set us high on a rock above those powers and forces that batter us, that tempt us, that work against us. We have sought your presence here, listening for your word, your word that gives life, your word that heals the wounded heart, your word that speaks truth. Teach us your way, O Lord Jesus. Lead us on a well-lighted path in the times when you are silent. Grant us the courage to wait, trusting in your grace that brings your resurrection power to our dead ends. You are doing a new thing among us, though at times it is hard to see what a new thing is. We bring to you our grieving over what is being lost, our fears about what the future might hold, our desire to love and serve you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you are refining us, purifying our discipleship, pulling us into following Jesus in this new world. Grant us mercy and grace to trust you more deeply, for the only secure place is with you, our light and our salvation, the stronghold of our life. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, the firstborn of your new creation of hope, our life. Now please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Maggie? Good morning, everyone. I was asked to speak on behalf of the generosity team and this year, the generosity team has as its theme, abundant life. So Katrina asked me to take a look at how this church uses justice and love to help create abundant life for all. Well, I started thinking about all that this church has given to me, but you don't have 20 minutes, so I will reduce it to just the very first memory that I have, I joined this church 40 years ago. 
and I'll give you a little history as I tell my story. Forty years ago at this church, we had three ministers, and one of them was named Herb Yeager. Well, Herb Yeager knew a few things about me. He knew that I loved theater, and he knew that I had a seven-year-old son. And so he invited me on one Sunday uh, evening to go to the parsonage and join a group of people who were going to create a Maundy, Thurs a Maundy Thursday play to be put on. And it was a very special moment for me. I thought that someone had seen who I was and what I needed, and someone invited and included me. And to me, that is the very heart of and beginning of love, which this church has shown to so many of us. Um, and the play that we worked on, created, was, okay, the Lord's Supper is a bunch of men. What happens if we do think, uh, take a look at the women who were probably in the background creating the meal? So we were asked to broaden our perspective, take a look at something more. And that is another thing that this church does. It draws the circle wide and draws it wider still. And so we're asked to see others and to include others. And that particular Sunday, uh, Monday Thursday worship, I was on stage with Betty Bailey. We did the play. It was my very first play at UCC. Um, so having received so much, the very first step, I mean, there were retreats. My son said, Mom, could we live here? Um, he loved it so much. And um, so when Herb said to me, Maggie, wouldn't you like to chair the intergenerational committee? Well, I was afraid, <laughs> but I had to say yes and just got more gifts. We used to, 40 years ago, have huge Advent workshops. We would start preparing for them in the summer and gathering things together. I'm not a craft person, so Herb saw my nerves and he said, don't worry, Maggie, Carly Bissell be will be with you. So no, I did not have to worry. And I received yet another gift. So as I was thinking about um, the giving and the receiving, every time you give, you do receive more. And that rhythm of giving and receiving is essentially to me the rhythm of life. And it certainly is the essence of love. And you find a lot of it right here, because here's the church and here's the steeple, open the doors, and they're the greatest gift of all, the people. So thank you very much. It is abundant life that you find here.
offerings make a difference in this life of the community we love, serve, and reflect. May these gifts and offerings extend beyond the borders and boundaries of the stones that encase us to the world that needs us. May these gifts and offerings be a balm to the world in need of comfort and a fire to the world in need of refining. May it begin with us and flourish beyond us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. For announcements today, please take a look in your bulletins for the upcoming events that are listed. And now I'll invite Allison and Kayla to come up and talk about the immigration and refugee team. Good morning. Um, we are on the immigration refugee team. We just have an update. Um, as you know, we're working with uh, Church World Services uh, to co-sponsor a family of refugees. Um, we have now been given or assigned a family, and um, we're still at the stage of figuring out exactly when they're coming. Kayla will tell you a bit more about them. Um, <clears throat> CWS has secured housing for them. As soon as we know what that housing actually looks like and we have measurements for windows, et cetera, um, we will be sending out an email um, or asking Kim to send out an email with things that we might be able to contribute. Um, right now, we don't have any specifics, so we're just holding off on asking for things just yet. The one thing that um, our, uh, we have, a, we have a, a worker assigned to us from CWS, um, and the one thing that they did say is that bicycles are always really needed. So if anybody has a bicycle for an adult um, or a child, but specifically for adults lying around, um, please let me know, or Kayla, or Jen Hand, um, or any of the other people on our team. And Kayla can tell you a bit more about the family. Yeah, uh, so what we know so far about the family is very uh, basic, but we have been matched with the family. We know that they're supposed to come fairly soon, so, end of November or beginning of December, somewhere between November 20th and December 15th. Um, yeah, but <laughs> sometime fairly soon in general. We also know that they're coming from Syria. Um, they don't speak English, and we know that it's a multi-generational family, so there are grandparents and there are two young kids. Um, but as Allison said, we just wanted to update you on that this is happening and that they're coming, um, but more details will come. Just if you know you have a bicycle around, that's the one thing we know that we'll need so far, but besides that, please hold off on asking about um, donations and things, because that will be coming soon when we have more details and specifics. How many bikes do you need? Um, I guess ideally four for the adults and two for the kids, I guess, I'm assuming, yeah. Yeah, the idea is that they won't have a, a car to get around, likely, um, especially in the beginning. So um, bicycles will be helpful in that sense. But more updates to come. And also Janet has an announcement next. How appropriate that Tim gave this wonderful discussion of our sanctuary and these windows. I've always been curious about what they meant. And for some of us, a sanctuary is not just the church. It's a theater. <clears throat> so this Friday, we opened Follies at the Glen Ridge Women's Club, in which our beloved Emily Rosick uh, is choreographing, phenomenal choreogra choreography. But it's the story of 1971 on the day when a valued, precious theater is going to be torn down for a parking lot in New York City. I think it's loosely based on the new Amsterdam theater, which lovingly wasn't torn down for a pain. <laughs> and uh, it's a reunion of, more or less based on the Ziegfeld Follies, called the Weissman Follies. And those of us who were in it between the two wars come back and say goodbye to our sanctuary. I hope you'll join us. There's a flyer on the community uh, bulletin board out there.
Good morning. I'm Catherine Spinell. I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of the Racial Justice Ministry Team and the Creation Justice Ministry Team. Um, and delighted to report that on Friday night we had almost 30 people gathered in the assembly room in the guild room to watch a screening of the sacrifice zone describing the pollution and damage to the neighbors of the incineration plant in our own backyard in Newark. Um, we spoke with the director um, and a neighborhood activist after the film. And this morning, some of you may have watched it on your own, but we are going to continue the discussion in a second hour um, following coffee hour, turning our um, focus less from inform informing ourselves to action steps. What can we as individuals and as a community collectively um, undertake? So that's one announcement, second hour. Secondly, I won't repeat it, but I would like to call everybody's attention to the dis longish description in your bulletin of the gathering this Thursday evening in Newark as part of our um, union's participation in New Jersey Together, a grassroots uh, movement collection of nonprofits and faith communities throughout Essex and throughout New Jersey. As you can see in your bulletin, the focus of the agenda will be on criminal justice reform, housing, and um, housing possibilities for adults with disabilities. We are planning, I know of a handful of folks who are planning to attend. We'd love to have another handful at least of folks from Union, um, so the specifics are here, but feel free to grab me during coffee hour because we're hoping to carpool if you'd like to go down as part of a group. Thank you. One more very short announcement. The Women's Retreat is coming up. This is just to save the date, January 17th to 19th, being led by Yuli Bertland from the Pakenak Church. Um, it promises to be a wonderful weekend at our usual wonderful place, Trinity Retreat Center in West Cornwall, Connecticut. So January 17th to 19th, thanks. musical sentence there's a little sign that means to repeat and then it happens again at the bottom so you'll actually sing the first two lines twice the third the last half of the second line third line and fourth line twice then we'll end it so kind of confusing follow along you're gonna be great um, in English? In English? It, yes in English please okay 
Unless you want to sing it, not in English. You go. That's your life. Okay. Um. Honestly, not need a hymnal for this. It's hymn number 288, 288, um, but it's Be Thou My Vision. Um, we're going to be doing verses one and four. We're doing two this time, but I would invite you, if you were able, to rise in body and spirit for the singing of our final hymn, Be Thou My Vision. as we close our service with an affirmation of faith found on page 887 in the Black Hymnal. It's the very last page of text. And we'll read this in unison. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe, we believe in God, God who has created and is creating, who has, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and to make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, Whose is high and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Friends, our service is ended, but our work begins. May we walk in the light over the coming week in fellowship with one another. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>